thank you for coming out. Um, my name is Marcus. I am the Vice President of the Student Center Public Trust. And today for Ethics Week, we have Thomas Sedlacek here. Uh, he was born in Prague at 24 years old. He was um, an advisor for the Czech uh, President. He later became a member of the National Economic Council uh, advisory body for the Czech Prime Minister. Um, he currently works as a chief macroeconomic strategist at a Czech commercial bank. And his talk today will focus on whether or not we are moving into a new digitalized virtual realm. So without further ado, here is Thomas. Okay.
suddenly comes Enron and we went like, oh, okay, that's not supposed to happen. Um, and it was quite interesting because if you look at the um, S&P charts, or especially NASDAQ, in this case it's better to look at S&P, the hit that you, your markets got from the Enron scandal was actually much deeper and much longer than the 9-11, which brings me to another sort of a breaking point of our Western civilization is in Enron we learned that, well, if we're not safe from ourselves. And with 9-11 we learned that even America, even Pentagon, even you know, the most guarded place of our Western civilization isn't actually protected well enough. And then came other crises, and uh, the most recent crisis, which we are now celebrating sort of 10 years anniversary from the collapse of Lehman Brothers, uh, that was yet another uh, collapse of our way of, of thinking. We're, since we're trying to find new ways of organizing ourselves, and we've been trying this for 10 years very, very intensely, and we haven't really come up with uh, something completely new. So, uh, so that's where we are right now. Uh, this was the, the, the quickest fly through. Uh, I skipped a little bit about the Gilgamesh in the New Testament and the Old Testament. And I did not mention Aristotle and, and, and Adam Smith. Uh, but you know this by heart, I'm sure. So it will be unnecessary repetition. Uh, and the question is, what's going to happen in, uh, in, in the upcoming uh, decades? My thesis, and I try to be as provocative as possible because as every lecturer, I am driving between two extremes. People falling asleep on me and people throwing things at me. So uh, from these two extremes, I, I tend to be on the people throwing things at me rather than uh, you falling asleep on me. So. Uh, Take it with a pinch of salt, but we ain't got much time and uh, quite a problem here. So my thesis will be that we are actually uh, evaporating in uh, sort of a... Let, let me actually ask you a question that might be helpful. Um, how many of you have has an alarm clock? By alarm clock, I mean uh, the thing that weighs about two pounds, has two bells. That's an alarm clock. So, where, where, where did the rest of the alarms go? <laughs> Sir? Digital clock. Okay. So, so can I see your alarm clock? I don't, I don't have that one. I don't have that one on me, but I do have the phone. All right. Okay, can you show me where it is? Where my alarm clock is? Yeah, yeah. You said you had one, so. <coughs> Sorry, I don't have it on. Yes, you do have it inside, right? <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Yes, I have an alarm clock in this. Okay. Alarm Where is it? Approximately, it's on your home screen, maybe. Yeah. Okay. What's her name? Scott. Scott. Scott has his alarm clock. What's the difference between your alarm clock and you? What's the residual? What's the thing that uh, he has? You have it, your alarm lives in a clockwork orange, whereas yours lives in that. I think it's a cell phone, right? Yes. Okay. So what, what is it that, that, that remained from the alarm clock? Yeah, so uh, zeros and ones? That, that's what you mean by digital, okay. All right. Yes, sir? Uh, the function remains. Excellent, function, okay. So we got zeros and ones, function remains.
Plato turned everything upside down. So, yeah. The purpose? The purpose, exactly. The telos in uh, my version of new uh, old Greek. Uh, what would a priest say? Synagogues, churches, mosques. I feel I'm uh, I dare you know, misdirected. Yeah. You don't need an alarm clock at a monastery because the church has bells. They'll ring the bell. <laughs> okay. <you know? laughs> All right. They'll ring it when it's time to eat. Yeah. Okay. But but in your contemplating time in the monastery, what is it that that's remained from <coughs> the machine. Well, I suppose everybody wants to wake up. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be woken up. But what, what's, what's the function that, that remained? This, well, maybe, maybe a spiritual person would call it a, a spirit of the alarm, right? We talk about spirit of capital. Talk about spirit of democracy. So a spirit of the alarm has sort of moved. So my thesis is why am I bothering you with the analysis of an aqua is that this will happen to mankind exactly in the same fashion. We will die in our physical bodies, but we will live in the new digital. Uh, that's my uh, hypothesis. We will need definitely new ethics for that. Uh, uh, we are getting into an age where Money is dramatically changing its, its function. We are uh, coming to a situation where we can have global monopolies that could change uh, ownership within maybe days or seconds, and where ideas are much more expensive than matter itself. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know that the Uber application is has market evaluation like Ford and General Motors combined, even though they don't actually own a single car. It's just uh, sort of a, an, an idea. Um, now, um, there's an extremely interesting experiment going on right underneath our feet, um, talking about whether mankind needs government to organize itself, or whether we can organize ourselves spontaneously. It's actually an ethical question. It's, uh, it's a question whether we human beings can relate to each other without the threat of some external force. In other words, can we, to a certain degree, believe in less than fair, um, or do we need regulation? Now, what how does this have to do with the internet? Well, uh, the internet is actually quite an interesting example of a unregulated, almost unregulated entity. There are some laws on the internet, but you all know they're actually suggestions rather than laws, and then they're all pretty much breakable. It's unimaginable that we would have this sort of laws uh, relating our uh, coexisting with each other. There are no taxes on the internet. There is no central authority. You don't need to. You can be actually quite anonymous most of the time. You, you, you are being anonymous. Of course, it's somewhat easy to find who you are if you're CIA, but it's also quite easy to hide yourself from CIA if you really, really want to. Uh, it's, a, it's a new entity. Let me ask you a question. I've never asked uh, this in America. When I speak of the internet, would you rather describe it as an organism or an organization? Which word sounds <coughs> more appropriate? You all guys with... Me too. I feel that if I, if I were forced to decide between these two words. So it's new. It's sort of an organism. It almost has a will of its own. It also has some sort of a gravity, which uh, seems to be more... Uh, it's, it's a stronger gravity than just rationality gives you. It's sort of... You get very easily addicted to it. I don't know if you know the series Black Mirror. Uh, you do? Okay, good. So that really simplifies my work. Uh, Black Mirror is, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, Kafka and uh, Brave New World combined with George Orwell on digital steroids. Is that a good description? Good description. Those of you who didn't see it, do not watch them two episodes a day. 
I think it's, it's not safe for, uh, for a normal functionality of the brain. But, but we are going there whether we want it or not. So it a little bit reminds sort of this, this animal that we call capitalism. It also has sort of a will of its own. It's a little bit wiser than all of us individually. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that uh, I call the unorchestrated orchestrator. There was a big debate whether uh, economics should be normative or not. You know that normative is a statement that says you should do something, whereas a positive statement is that this is the way it is. And there's been a long debate in, in, in the ethical school, at least that I come from, I, I suppose it was pretty similar here too, whether we should be normative in economics, in other words, whether we should have normal norms, whether we should have ethical norms, or whether economics should be merely a study focusing on how things actually are. Uh, and my claim here is that the markets are normative backwards. You are not to tell them what to do, they will tell you what to do. In fact, they will shape your life. They are shaping, in fact, your studies. They are shaping the markets, are shaping you right now, whether you want it or not. They are shaping your decisions. They are shaping maybe even some of claim the partner that you may have or will choose. Um, you're being shaped normatively by an entity that's sort of very hard to describe. And the same thing is happening with the internet. The internet, uh, this sort of new habitat that we are building, is shaping the way that we exist. Now let me uh, give you a small little story, to be a little bit practical, from Czech Capital Markets. Uh, I don't need a yes. Yeah, well, Um, we had an experiment about spontaneous uh, markets because communism was uh, almost complete control. We had no competition. Uh, Marx came up with the idea that uh, competition wastes a lot of energy on marketing, on, on competition itself. And of course we all know about the economies of scale. So if we could have one big car factory instead of six, we could have a huge, uh, uh, huge, uh, is the word huge sensor here? Uh, huge factory producing cars much cheaper than uh, in competition. And in fact, and I will never forget Western economists for this, in the beginning of communism, in the after war periods, the communist regimes actually worked, or it looked like, and in the, in the early years, they, they actually performed better than uh, capitalist countries. So in 1968, when there was a uh, sort of a Russian coup d'etat uh, to, to Prague, in the same year in Paris, the students were actually uh, it was a communist uh, riot that wanted. So the West was actually pretty curious about what's happening. Let's just call it the East. There was very little <coughs> criticism, and most of the most of my colleagues that were economists during the second part of the last century were actually looking at us with curiosity. And uh, uh, also, we had it was quite interesting. Um, so everything was regulated. So when that, then in 1989 we broke free, uh, we wanted to be capitalists as quick as possible, we wanted to be free. Uh, in all leadership and in all management, I suppose, good advice is never to burn your bridges if you're trying to change the structure of your organization when you're trying to do something new. You should always have a fallback strategy if something, something always goes wrong. But if something goes terribly wrong, you should have something to fall back onto. Uh, in 1989, that was exactly what we didn't want to do. We exactly wanted to do steps that would be irreversible. We had a certain amount of political energy. So this is communism. This would be capitalism. And uh, the belief was, and I think this was actually a, a, a pretty good way of looking at the problem, is that we need to get from here to here. There was no cookbook. We didn't by book, you know, how to get capitalists quick. Oh, actually, there's a poem by uh, anybody of Irish 
descent or origin. There's a poem by uh, Sinus Heaney that's called Instant Fish. It's a short poem, you don't have to be afraid, it's just, just one line. It says, add water and they swim. And that's sort of instant capitalism. You guys had, what, 200 years to build it. It begun not far from here in Klondike. Those were your first rules of corporate governance, were your guns. And slowly it evolved into, you know, white shirts and clean teeth and political correctness. Uh, yeah, so we needed to we needed to sort of give this ball enough inertia or enough thrust so that if something goes sour ten years down the line, the ball would not sort of fall back from its own energy into the original spot. So we had to hit it with a strong enough force so that it if then you let go, it, the natural tendency, the gravity would push it there. So this is what we call shock therapy. It needed to be, it, the system needed to be shocked. And there are 10,000 critiques of it, I am one of them, but this is not the time to, to critique. Now I want to talk to you about the experiment that we did with capital markets. So we uh, built our capital markets, um, uh, 80, Two, no wait, 98% of GDP, 98% of what the country produced in 1989 was government owned. So only 2%, basically your trousers, uh, was, was privately owned. Otherwise, so now you have to sort of get to the opposite, opposite direction. So we created capital markets and uh, did not create a securities commission because our belief was that our prime minister was a tea party you would say today I suppose uh, extreme tea party sort of a believer in the divine uh, almost regulating capacities of the markets whether he was right or not I uh, leave that to you but for seven uh, for, for, for five years, our capital markets were actually running without any regulations. Now, can you imagine if your New York Stock Exchange, if the Securities Commission would close its eyes for, I don't know, a day? And this was seven years. So in the beginning, people were afraid to steal. Uh, Czech language has uh, given the world two words. Anybody from uh, Czech Republic or Europe or your parents? There you go. So you know that we've given the word robot. Uh, comes from Czech. Robot means to work. Worker, laborer would be a proper translation. That's one word. And the second word is um, tunnel. To tunnel something. Not with the intention of actually building a tunnel, but with the intention of tunneling, sucking the money out of the bank. So, uh, uh, in the beginning, when we sort of forced a huge part of uh, the ownership, which was government owned, we sort of pushed that onto the markets. In the beginning, people were afraid to, to touch it, they didn't even know how to do it. Then they learned one of the one of the very few advantages of totalitarian regimes is that usually the criminality is lower because the, the punishments are more severe. And then the capital market started going down like this. This would be zero net asset. This is, this is net asset value, okay? And this is time. And this is zero. So, uh, a lot of people got rich in extremely unethical ways. If you want to, I can describe you some of the ways how to tunnel a company. We've learned that during the communist regime, uh, how to trick the system so that it works. But during the communism system worked thanks to corruption, I'm sorry to say. It was so rigorous and so rigid and so stupid, it would have collapsed in its own, on its own weight within a couple of years. But people, and in the case of capitalism, uh, sorry, communism, luckily, they started finding ways around the system. 
spreadsheets, but what will Americans play? Your football. We Europeans will play our football, meaning soccer. So first comes a big American guy, compared to the very lean French. And the guy takes the ball with his hands, doesn't have the proper shape, but hey, who cares? And he just starts walking. And the French guys will start, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't touch the ball with your hands. But remember, no jury, nobody to whistle. So what will the uh, American guy say? Probably nothing. <laughs> and so who will win? Who will win? So first question, what sort of, a, what rules of the game will there be? Will it look more like soccer or will it look more like American football, which we call rugby? -ish? It will look like rugby. And who will win? Most likely the U.S. team. Yeah, pretty, pretty clear. So why am I telling you this? Well, I'm just saying that the rules of the game are changed not by the best player, but by the most aggressive. In this case, it would be American. Now just imagine two French guys who happen to have a knife in their pockets because they left it there from yesterday. <laughs> Suddenly, it wouldn't be so clear who would win, or if they had a rifle or something. So the rules of the game, if you don't have a jury, will be determined by the aggressive guys. <laughs> Which means that the good players, actually just imagine that we're trying to actually play soccer, means that the good players get, get crowded out. Now, that's what happened in this period in Czech Republic. So the rules of the game started looking like rugby, and it wasn't the best business people, the best shoemakers, but it was actually people who tried, who had the best contact with the government. Etc. Etc. Now, what's going to happen? So that's the past. How do you think the world will look? The economy, the economy, will look like in the new setting of um, of us actually being evaporating into a new world of living in a digital habitat. I think also we will leave our bodies sooner or later. We will use our bodies like we use, how do you call these boots that you use in bad weather? Rubber boots? Yeah, once, twice a year for, for reproduction and for eating. But otherwise, we'll, our, our, our brains, our consciousness, our intent, our function spirit, algorithm, will be dwelling in this new habitat that we are building for ourselves. Ten years ago, it would be completely unimaginable. Ten years ago, the first iPhone was delivered to you by Steve Jobs. And uh, it was unimaginable that we would live in a new habitat called the Internet. Now it's actually quite imaginable. I would actually even, I would even uh, claim that <coughs> You're already there. Half, half your leg, half your, half your consciousness is already there. If I took your cell phone, no, let's put it this way: if you took my cell phone, you'd completely disorient me. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know how to find a way back to the hotel. I think I wouldn't know who to call. I, I don't remember my mother's phone number. I'd be disoriented. I wouldn't be able to work. I wouldn't be able to. How many of you don't have a cell phone? Yeah. Ten years ago, you still. They have the people that would be very completely satisfied and full and enjoy their lives without a cell phone. That was actually unimaginable. So just imagine how it would look like in 20 years. See how it changed us in the last 10 years. And um, you see how it will change us in the next, next 10 years. So do we need um, a new, new economics for uh, Living in a place where there is no scarcity, that's one. You know that the main defining characteristics of the field called economics is that 
it has to do with the word scarcity. You can only buy and sell things that are scarce and that are actually tradable. I can't trade you my good feeling. I can only trade you a painting or a movie, but I can't actually trade a thing that is untradable. And now we're living in a time where, where, where new products don't, don't cost anything. We are also moving into, um, into uh, sort of a planetized system. Uh, our theoretical physicists are coming up with uh, the, uh, I don't know if you've heard about the Kardashian scale. Any one of you interested in science? Of science fiction. Uh, Kardashian has nothing to do with Kim. Uh, is a Russian theoretical astrophysicist who uh, is uh, ranking with civilizations according to their usage of energy. So, civilization type one can use the energy that's falling on their planet 100%. Civilization number two can harvest, or oh, sorry, type two can harvest the uh, energy of their nearest star which in our case is the sun, so they would build a sphere, or a swarm around the sun, gather all the energy, because most of the energy of the sun goes into empty space. Uh, we only a very, 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 very small fraction of the solar energy actually falls on this beautiful small tiny planet, which is a speck of dust orbiting the sun at about, if the sun would be this size, the earth would be orbiting 120 feet from it. Really tiny. The rest of the energy is going off into literally nowhere. And then there's a type 3 civilization that can harvest the energy of the entire uh, galaxy, etc., etc., etc. Why am I saying this? Is that we are a civilization type. That, that's 
that's, and that's usually the point of analysis that commentators take. But I've never heard nobody, anybody notice that there is actually a Freudian slip of tongue in it. Who wants to move backwards instead of forward? Yeah. Cool, but still, not what I'm looking for. And you are Americans. Did you ever check in the list of countries? No country called America. <laughs> <laughs> it's an Anglo continent. So here am I thinking, oh my god, finally, somebody who wants to make Mexico great again. And Cuba and Venezuela and Canada is also part of a continent called America. In fact, if you would be disallowed to be called Americans, what would you be? You are the greatest superpower in the world in many, many different education-wise and economy-wise and politically and warfare, but you don't have a name. What would you be? United Statians? Because Yankees wouldn't do. Right? Somebody sometimes says, yeah, what about Yankees? I said, I don't think so. But then again, I don't know, this is your, your culture of war. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, anyway, that's just a side joke. But the point is that uh, I was, of course, of course, he meant he wants to make the United States of America great again. I suppose that's what he meant to say. But he was actually right. That's why it's a Freudian slip of tongue, is that the only way how to make the United States of America great again is to actually make America great again. There will be no peace in your heads if there will be one suffering country you are moral enough to have that same like, uh, like we should. So um, how will we relate to each other if we no longer will be in a competitive position vis-a-vis -vis each other, but we'll start understanding each other as one planet? And now there already are institutions on this planet that are type one. So type zero, a nation state, with its politics is a typical product of a civilization type zero. We simply want to be better off than your neighbors. By the way, who do you make fun of here in Colorado? Wyoming, Nebraska too. Good. It's always fun that you make fun of the, the neighbors. You know, nobody makes fun of Poles here or, or Belgians. We make fun of Poles exactly because they make fun of us because we're their neighbors, so. And Nebraska is not uh, on, on your joke candidate list also? All right. It's funny. But anyway, what's an organization type one, United States? Sayuzniki, actually. Which is how the Russians would call them. Soviet. Soviet. Okay. An institution type one means a planetary institution makes doesn't matter where you're from it won't even know where you're from for example internet internet is a institution type one it is not one part of the internet fighting the other part of the internet it's simply somehow flowing together businesses for example are also more type one than they are type zero. Um, how will the world look like with one currency? With no longer currencies competing up against each other. How will the world look like with fiscal policy that's not connected to the government, but it's somehow connected to uh, sectors of the economy, which I think would be more fitting because banking sector has nothing to do with the car industry and borders of countries have no economic role to play. How will uh, the economy look like where uh, mark, uh, the capital flows will be completely unrestricted as they almost are becoming to be? What will be the new currency when there will be no longer scarcity? Uh, you can see the old world disappearing Maybe this is also the part that you three gentlemen alluded to, this sort of back when America was once great again, is when, when things actually mattered. The people don't work anymore, I suppose. You're all studying here exactly because 
you're not going to work. And I'm going to work in my life. All I do is I talk. On YouTube, all you ever done in your life was talking. Or listening. And when you work in a bank, all you do is talking. You talk, 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 talk. Some of those meetings are funny because they're called like strategy, vision, fairy tale, telling each other meetings and who has the best fairy tale will become the CEO sooner or later. And if your presentation contains most numbers, you become the CFO. But at the end of the day, it's just a story, You're just telling each other stories and, and advertising is stories and marketing is stories. And, and um, real work, as in work, is evaporating. The reality is evaporating, or natural reality is evaporating. We're entering this new, new dimension that's completely unreal and completely artificial. So if you were born in a city, which I suppose some of you, most of you were, you've never seen anything natural. Look around you right now. Everything artificial, made by human beings for human beings. We can no longer survive in the natural world. Even the tree that may be outside in the middle of the campus is just there because somebody decided that it would look good there. But it no longer serves the purpose of something that used to scare us and frighten us and attack us back in the day. So uh, we're coming to, we have what, 10 more minutes and then I'll open up, how we doing? Yeah. And I'll open it up for, for questions. What I was trying to say is that we are going through a very dramatic transformation. I went through one myself from communism to capitalism and um, it was funny because I uh, want one more thing that I need to tell you about or I wanted to tell you about comparing capitalism with communism was um, we also had crises. The economy also suffered crises. But those were, you know, in economics everything is demand and supply. Well, not everything, but we like to look at some things. Some things are useful when you look at it through the prism. Demand and supply. So uh, the economy had crises, but those would be supply side. Crisis. We wanted sugar, but there was no sugar. I remember one summer holiday, uh, I was a Boy Scout, and uh, one of those games that we played was trying to get sugar. So we would run around the whole town trying to buy some more little pieces of sugar so we could take them to our summer camp. So we wanted to, the demand was there, we wanted sugar, we wanted razor blades, but there were no razor blades, there was no sugar. Demand was uh, correct, the demand was willing, we were hungry, but the supply kept malfunctioning from the most unpredictable sort of the toilet paper would run out. Things that you wouldn't, because it was all planned, and the plan never really worked. So if you think of it in terms of a picture, you would have hungry people around an empty table. Demand was there, you would eat. There was nothing to eat, so to speak. Fast forward 20 years to 2008, 2009, and there the crisis was same, except exactly opposite. It was a crisis of demand. You can get as much sugar as you want, but nobody wants that much sugar anymore, and probably not to the people who use sugar all their lives. Razor blades challenge you. You can get 12 different types of blades raised within how much time do you need to get 12 different types of razor blades? 12 minutes, 20, half an hour? Nobody needs maybe 20 different types of razor blades. They now have ones with five blades. I don't know what's going to happen next. You have a razor blade like this. Uh, so uh, I think we'll talk about this in, uh, today in the afternoon when we'll be less philosophical and more practical. Um, but uh, the crisis that we had in 2008 was for sure not the last one. We don't know when the next one will strike, but we know that it will strike. And we seem to be doing exactly the same mistakes like we were doing in 2008. And uh, I want to close down a little bit earlier, give more minutes to, to the debate, and um, uh, actually stop monologuing and start picking your brains about how the new economy 
should look like. In our constitutions, we have that the economy should serve the public good. It's actually quite funny in most of the countries that do have constitutions, it regulates, it, it says that the economy is to serve the public good. And I don't know if you do it here, but we swear when we get our degree from the university, when we are graduating, we don't have the hats, which I always wanted, but never got. But we, we have robes, like really impressive. Um, Harry Popper, uh, Popper, Harry, <laughs> Harry Popper, no, I always confuse him with Popper. Yeah, Harry Potter, sorry, yeah, no, that's Carl Popper. Harry Popper, that sort of robes, and we walk in, we have these old buildings, make you feel really important just by being there, and we swear on, on the insignia of the university, which is made out of gold, and your parents are there, and your grandmother's crying, and taking pictures, it's like a big day in your, uh, in your life. It's also the only day when you swear, because when you have a wedding, you promise each other something that you don't actually swear. We do, when we finish our university education, we swear. And we swear in Latin so that nobody really knows what it is that they're swearing, which is interesting. It's the only oath that we take in our life. Do you do that? Do you, do you swear? You don't, you don't take an oath? Okay, we do. It's sort of, I think, it comes from the Middle Ages. And, um, we swear that we will not use what we've learned from our professors and from our colleagues and from our books, uh, the time of that society gave us, and we swear a solemn oath that we shall not use our knowledge against society and that we shall not use it for our private uh, function only, but that we will use what we know to benefit the society. That gave us education, that clothed us, that fed us since the morning of our lives. So I'm opening up a debate. Anybody of you has an idea of how the new economy should look like? I just want to mention we have a few of your books that you can give away. Oh, okay, as a threat. <laughs> <laughs> the one who does not ask the question will have to read the book. <laughs> I think that might work better. Huh? <coughs> yes, sir. Um, so earlier in your lecture, you were saying that the web. Yeah, we sort of agreed that. Yeah, it that was like a, a flawed statement. It was kind of the same thing. without people, what does it work? Right? People put yeah. stuff into it. So yeah. 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 And so um, I was leading with this because if you're going to keep that concept. Uh, yeah, that's good. That actually, I like that. We'll continue. I kind of lost my So you're saying that. Um, that you don't, not, you don't like the word organism because it is composed of an underlaying... Yeah, but a car needs an organism, I mean, because it has all the compartments where it can be. Yeah, but okay. a person, it's not going to move. And so... Yeah, uh, but, but, but all organisms are dependent on their surroundings. Sure, I mean, you can say that. You can't have... So this is also quite interesting. Where there are bees, there are also flowers. Where there are flowers, there are also bees. So if you kind of take two steps back, you can also say, following your argumentation, that B is not an independent organism from flowers. That in fact, although it doesn't seem like they're actually one, bees and flowers are one organism, and you could go on with that. But what, I, I guess, I actually, I didn't call it organism. Oh, we, we, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I sort of, I, I, because it, it has a behavior, it has a will of its own. This is some, ah, you guys like movies? Uh, Lord of the Rings? Okay. Leadership. So. The whole name of the trilogy by Tolkien is the CEO of the rings, right? Now the question is, who is the Lord? We don't, I, I sort of miss it. I think we should call our bosses lords. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, CS, CEO and CFO is the Lord. So the, yeah, professor, or lord, or master. So who is the, who's the boss? Who's the boss of the ring? Huh? Okay, so... Ah, there, that's a good point. Speak out loud. Uh, I was just going to say... So, so you said your name, sorry? Nick. So Nick said the Lord of the Ring was whoever was in the possession of it. Sure. Right? What did you change? Well, that is, but the Lord of the Rings, the Rings in charge of whoever... Aha! Uh -huh. And that's a book-worthy book answer. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you can always give it away. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so say it again. Well, in Lord of the Rings, the person...
person, the, the rig is generally in charge of whoever's holding it. So yeah, yeah, you're too quick. You, I mean, I like to do it slowly because when people say Gollum, and in Gollum it's sort of difficult to see who owns who. Is you skip the you skip it, uh, ahead to my push to Gollum. Uh, but yeah, Gollum is a good transitionary period, and I call it, so why why I, why I think I would call it organism, and why I think most of you would be leaning towards rather calling it organism than an organization, because car is an organization, so it's not an organism. It is that it has a will of its own. So the ring had a will of its own because it could control its masters. The Golem of Prague, has anyone ever know the story about the Golem of Prague? Okay, so you get it. Um, it's just like the Lord of Rings. Even in, uh, even in Christianity, actually, if I may, the whole problem is similar. Sin sort of gets an intention of its own. So this is Christianity in five seconds. You guys ready? <laughs> in the beginning, God this is a creates human beings. Why am I misspelling? Human beings. <laughs> then something goes wrong. And God has to die in order not to destroy this. Is that a fair summary? I didn't leave, leave some of the juicy parts. <laughs> <laughs> but the essence is, and I call this subject object reversal, so I really thank you for, uh, for pointing this out. Subject object reversal. And that's when uh, something that was supposed to be in a subordinate position actually becomes controlling the original maker. So when Jesus becomes a servant, it's not just because he likes to polish people's feet. But it actually had to be. You really had to go under. You can see this in Lord of the Rings. You can see it in Matrix, for example. Uh, human beings, HB, <laughs> creates AI to serve us, to, to give us more degrees of freedom, uh, to toil for us, to work for us. And then the quote goes. Morpheus tells Neo, we don't know who's stroke first. So we, we don't know how this, it's sort of a black box. How it gets reversed, we don't know, or I don't know. But the guess is when you get too dependent on something, because Saruman actually, or let's go back to the Lord, is it Saruman or Saruman? Saruman. 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 Okay. Saruman. Saruman is the, is the white wizard. Yeah, that's bad. Also, they should have consulted with somebody for marketing. <laughs> uh, he creates the, the ring of power, ring of ROP. Exactly because he wanted more degrees of freedom, he wanted more, he wanted actually the ring to, to do the dirty work sort of for him. And my thesis is that if you put too much of the too much of your will, you become if you fetishize it too much, you can't live without it anymore then it has a tendency to uh, uh, subject-object reverse. So at the end of the day, which was a big surprise to me when you read, not in the movies, but when you actually read the book, the big uh, fight between Middle-earth and Mordor actually never takes place because what? What destroys Mordor? The ring. And like Boromir said, such a small, tiny, little thing actually destroyed, dismantled Mordor. They actually didn't have to fight at the end of the day. So, uh, so in, to, to, to actually answer your question, that's why I think it reminds us of an organism, because it can get a will of its own. You have other examples. Games can be... be uh, did you ever see... Uh, uh, this is an older movie, but maybe somebody... Uh, Being John uh, Malkovich. Anybody saw? Okay, so one person. So anyway, that movie is about that. In the beginning, he's a puppeteer, and he becomes a puppet at the end. Of the, or do you guys read Kundera by any chance? It's it's a big it's a big. If you actually look for subject object reversals in your life and culture and movies, you're gonna have great fun because it's almost under every every stone. Warning from our past. Um, that when you actually speak of economics, there's a perfect example of the economy. And I guess we're going to be talking about that in the afternoon. The economy is taking upon itself debt. Actually, uh, you know what your debt level was, uh, deficit?
deficit level last year was 4.8. Yeah, um, no, well, it's for something. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. I, I'm, not, I'm not more wrong than half a percentage point, so let's just say 4.6. 4.6% of GDP is your annual debt last year. You know what your growth was of the economy last year? From January to January. 2 point something. Six. <coughs> of GDP. Anybody see the irony in that? You bought 2.4% of GDP growth for 6.6%, 4.6%. So that's like buying uh, $100 for $200. Which is a good deal. <laughs> that's what you do. That's what your economy has been doing. Because if you had a balanced budget, you would be not growing at all, most likely. If you actually went down from this to just say 2%, Deficit, you would be zero ish. It's sort of hard to, hard to calculate that, but just like cowboy style without putting that. So, anyway, so the economy wants to grow faster than it would normally. It takes upon itself debt, and uh, then the whole economy collapses because of, you, you even call it debt service actually, the amount of interest rates that you have to pay every year to serve. Serve actually, and also talk about Christianity. I don't know if you know this. This is the, you'll have great fun with this. The word debt uh, is the same word for sin in the New Testament Greek. So uh, Jesus' prayer is, "Forgive us our debts, like we forgive those who are indebted to us." And the same structure: you, you, you sin because you want to have more degrees of freedom. You overdo it. You, 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 you bang. Again, Christianity, so I hope you guys don't mind. Alright, yeah. So, uh, and my, my uh, theory, of course, is that the internet is an organism with a will of its own. That's what I meant, that it has larger gravity. Don't you do this sometimes, if you just pull out your cell phone, and you know perfectly well that nobody's texted you, not them. Did you just touch it? Like the precious? <laughs> have in his pocket, you know, right. and you just touch it just to see that the electrons are actually functioning, and you put it back, and uh, it's also your biggest neighbor, it says in the New Testament, you should love your neighbor, who's your neighbor, your cell phone, you never spend so much time with nobody else, first thing you touch in the morning, last thing you touch in the morning, why does he even take it with you to the toilet, slave owners back in the day were brutal, but you could at least pee in peace. <laughs> So, uh, if you don't have very strong control over the fetish object, which could be debt, which could be um, the, uh, the markets, which I was trying to demonstrate with, this, with the American and French footballers playing together, if you don't have it in control, it will sort of control the rules itself. Uh, there's a beautiful, there is a beautiful poem by, no, okay, let's, yeah, yeah. so, uh, yeah, if we just let it go and lose it, it will potentially destroy us. That's what all, all movies, not just movies, but even serious philosophers like, yeah, like Elon Musk, uh, they fear that AI could be the best thing that we've ever made, like the, like the ring of power, whatever you went want would come true. This, of course, comes from the Ring of Gauges from, from Plato. Those of you who study Nazis, you know this. It's an ancient problem that if you have something that actually fulfills you all your dreams, it screws you up. That's the golden fish. You have these stories about the golden fish? Bill Gates catches a golden fish, you know this one? And um, you know, wants to throw it back, and the golden fish says, hey, what about the three wishes? And Bill says, okay. Uh, first wish is something excessive, second wish is something more excessive, and the third wish is please return something, uh, please return everything to the original state of things. Yes? So, where did you do such absurd things? Would you 
you'd like to stand up because I have a hard time. Yeah, sure. Um, sorry to change the subject so quickly, but... No. Um, I get stuck on old subjects, so thank you for being stuck. You said the internet um, was like shaping like who we are, and I would argue that it's also shaping society. So cryptocurrency is like a big part of that. So I'm wondering what's your take on the viability of it? And it's the last sentence. What's your take on the viability of cryptocurrency? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Great question. Uh, I never got to do this. This is actually funny. And you, uh, thank you. So just. Real quick, uh, cryptocurrencies have two, two, uh, in my, uh, actually I have, uh, I try to sort of come up with the best of, uh, you can find me on YouTube and on Facebook, and I have a lecture which is called Going Into the Abstract, where our art, where our, where our, where I argue how everything around us is becoming more and more, yeah. Sorry, to kind of go off of what she said, and back to your literary, your literary um, examples earlier, like I've, I've read a lot about um, basically the economy like eventually being run more on information, not yes. just information systems, but like on exchange of information. Like yeah. being able to exchange a company's proprietary information, but also, um, like do you ever get concerned that a small group of people with sufficiently advanced technology, like drones, and will just be able to control the entire planet, like within the Kardashev scale. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. And, and there, there are many lectures on this. We you live in this beautiful time that you're not only dependent on your education from your professors that you have, you can actually do it in the evening at home while you're ironing or doing something, something in the privacy of your home. So, anyway, if I may suggest, there, there, there's a lecture by me called uh, Abstractly Lives a Man or Digitally Lives a Man. And, and there are argue, even I show that IBM and uh, Microsoft and Google as sort of, I don't know if you guys still remember this one, but we do. This used to be the hero of the day. I'll be right with you. Uh, but they made things, right? Actually, matter. And then these guys no longer make matter, they make zeros and ones. They make systems, they make rational organizations. But it's still an organization, it's not an organism. It's like a car thing, but, but without the, the, the alarm clock, the clockwork orange. And then comes Google, so you can see those immense steps in the abstract. I mean, you would not be able to explain what Microsoft is to somebody living at the end of the 19th century. You would not be able to explain to Google what Google is to somebody who only knows IBM. It would be actually unimaginable. And in each one of those steps, it goes more and more abstract, more and more unimaginable. These, things, these guys, from a marketing point of view, these guys don't even sell anything. You can't actually, as a customer, you can't actually really, or they're not making money on selling to customers, they're selling customers, which is a completely weird, uh, so, so uh, cryptocurrency, and again, we could really go quickly through the history of currency, but you know that it used to be something knockable, then it used to be gold, and then it used to be fiat, but it was still represented as paper money. Uh, and now it's plastic cards, which is actually quite funny. Uh, and the next step, but, it, but plastic card is still, is still uh, guaranteed by your nation, so it's type zero. U.S. dollars are guaranteed by U.S. government. Well, guaranteed, theoretically speaking, but I won't scare you. As an economist, you should never tell people who don't study economics that the money is not covered by anything because they get, they get scared for good reasons. We are actually taught not to be scared of it, but anyway. So, and um, uh, so they're covered by the government, and they're political. So they're national and political. Crypto is none of those two. So uh, to cut the long story short. How would you do quantitative easing with, uh, with cryptocurrency being the global currency of the world, let's say? You would not be able to do that. That's the whole point of cryptocurrency, that it's politically uninfluenceable, which of course brings a happy bell in many of our, sorry, because you know, politics is very often a synonym of something inherently stupid, but you have politics every time you decide where to go for holidays. You have politics with your mother and father and grandmother and 
But um, so so we would be we would be so if we have no dollars, no national currency, if we only have cryptocurrency, and we had 2008 um, uh, sort of a situation, what would happen to interest rates? It's not a tough question. They would skyrocket. Because the whole point of the crisis was that. It was a credit crunch, credit means faith, so it was a faith crunch. We didn't trust each other, and if you don't trust each other, you raise the interest rates. If I trust you, I lend you at low interest rates. If I don't, I hit you with a large one. So, so, uh, so the governments would not be able to artificially devaluate, so to speak, future, because zero interest rates meant that the future is risk-free. We pretended. Um, and... Uh, Again, I think something we will talk about in the afternoon in the more, more sort of practical. Uh, but, so, so that's the downside. But, but, but it makes sense from the, from the sort of history of currency. It's, it's more, it goes, so this is type, type 1, and it's also digital. So in 100 years, in 200 years, yeah, I think so. But not now. Today it's bungee jumping. 